Secretary Zinke is a Montanan with roots in both eastern Montana as well as western Montana. Uh, so he's learned the whole thing. Uh, graduate of Whitefish High School, so he's a bulldog in more ways than one. Then became an Oregon duck, which I think all led to becoming a Navy SEAL. <laughs> But seriously, he was a congressman that provided us with a lot of support. In fact, he was an original sponsor in the House of one of the pieces of um, tax incentive legislation. So for that, we're very appreciative. Uh, he is, in fact, the first Montanan to ever serve in the cabinet. Now, we did have a nominee many, many years ago who was nominated and died on the train on the way to uh, <laughs> D.C. to be sworn in. So this is our this is our chance for fame. <laughs> Most notably, he um, rode a horse to work on his first day, resplendent in a cowboy hat and a jacket from the Helmville Rodeo. Now the Helmville Rodeo is a Labor Day event that he attended. Um, it's in a little town that's probably 100, 200 people, but they put on a fantastic celebration. So we're here to celebrate Secretary Zinke. Thank you. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll spend about 10 minutes uh, talking, and then we'll just talk at, uh, questions and answers on it. But up front, I, I'm not an advocate for selling or transfer land. Public land. So you, you, you know. and, but nor is the president. And a lot of the reason why I got the job is, you know, I buck Republican leadership, I buck Democratic leadership on issues that I I think have deviated from the path of Teddy Roosevelt. And much of the West, we live in the shadow of Roosevelt, and the legacy that he provided the country. Uh, I think many of us, you know, benefit from it, especially those that love our, our public lands. And as the secretary, I can tell you, it, it is enormous responsibility. And people forget how big Interior is. And I sat, you know, in the, at the Natural Resources Committee, and I didn't realize it was it's 12 time zones because we have the it, it's 12. It, we have starting in the Virgin Islands, it goes all the way to American Samoa. And about a fifth of the U.S. falls on your interior, uh, about 70,000 employees. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, where we're going. But uh, people ask me, what are my priorities? Uh, one is trust. If you go out west uh, in particular, we're not well liked uh, in a lot of places. And it bothers me. Uh, and why we're not well liked, it's either because the face of interior has become too more too law enforcement centric. And I'll tell you a quick story. Is I'm down in the Virgin Islands celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the transition from Denmark to the US. And it's a celebration and kids and parades and there's a group from Duke University down there. Uh, and yay Duke. <laughs> sorry sorry about the basketball. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we, have, we have a small refuge there, and it's a turtle habitat. So the kids are down there, and the tortoises come on shore, and they, they count the eggs, and they make sure they're buried, and they turn the tortoise around and send them back out to sea. Lovely program. So uh, at the parade, I, it's time to get a, a picture with the young students from Duke. So I'm there, and there's kids, and so I'm there, and we get to the steps, and here comes the ranger. Uh, the ranger's in a full flak jacket. It says, police. The gun's as big as she is. That's wrong. Because that's the face uh, of interior in some spots. And then we go out to Buck Island. Some of you have been out there, Buck Island, and we look like a SWAT team. So I'm concerned that the trust of, uh, and we hold the greatest majesties uh, in the interior. There's no question that the majesty of our public treasures are within interior. And I'll say a little bit in the Forest Service, but we got, we got a lot more. Uh, <laughs> but the trust piece of it, uh, and when we make a deal, we need to hold the deal. Uh, and 
Oftentimes, the industry doesn't trust us because we change the rules the last minute sometimes. It's very difficult to get through the NEPA process because it's not as transparent as it should be. And so we need to work on our trust. Uh, secondly is the infrastructure. Uh, I'm a big infrastructure guy. Uh, some folks have talked about the LWCF, which I strongly support. But if you go back to 2008, and I'm not giving judgment, but if you go back to 2008, we made just in offshore $15.5 billion more than we made last year. I'll repeat that. We made in 2008 in offshore $15.5 billion more than we made last year. So that, that's directly into LWCF. And our backlog of infrastructure in the parks, and I talk a lot about the parks because the parks are the front face. Uh, I talk about BLM sometimes, and if you're in the East Coast, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I, I talk a lot about the Park Service. Uh, the Park Service is about $12.5 billion behind in infrastructure. Uh, a lot of money. Half of that is actually roads. And half uh, or a third of the roads are roads that are outside our park system. And when you look at the inventory of what we own and what we don't, and we own Memorial Bridge. That's $250 million to repair. And then we own the George Washington Parkway, and the parkway going out to the, the uh, Baltimore Airport. We own parkways everywhere. And so we have a lot of infrastructure that most people would not count as interior property. And by the way, we have the territories. And I'm spending a little time in the territories. The territories at one time were in the front line, especially in the, in the west of the Japanese Empire. Uh, today, they feel like they're in the front line of the Chinese, uh, the economic empire, and they feel like they're forgotten. Um, but if you're out at American Samoa or the Marianas, I mean, they, they feel like they're a forgotten uh, entity. And so I'm spending a little time out there to shore it up. But a lot of it is infrastructure because we're responsible for that as well. So infrastructure is, is going to be a, a big push. <laughs> Uh, and so is revenue. Uh, and if you want to look at, at where I stand on issues, if you go to Yellowstone National Park and you look at the Roosevelt Arch, inscribed in stone above the, you know, on the arch is for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. I know, by the way, on the, on the right side of the arch is enacted by Congress. So, you know, those two entities, that what we do should be for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, and we got to work with Congress. Uh, if we go to that, and if you haven't read the 1916 National Park Enabling Act, you know, go back. And I understand Muir. Uh, Muir was a brilliant man, uh, and there are places where man is the lightest footprint, more of an observer, and we should respect that. Although if you read Muir's writings in Yosemite, as he's riding a horse through Yosemite, uh, you can't do that today. Too many down trees. So we need to be better at managing our property. And if you as, as trust, you, know, you manage your property better than we do. And managing the property is science. And yes, I believe in science. I'm a geologist. <laughs> it's science and best practices. Um, and when I look at, at some of our holdings and we're natural regulation, but we pick and choose. You know, we're willing to let the beetle kill go through our trees and not do anything about it, but zebra mussels, we're on. And I look at that and you go, you know, we need to be better managers. And it goes back to trust. And some places in the West, they don't believe that the federal, should have a, federal government should have an estate at all. Uh, there are that, those groups. And, to diffuse the anger is we have to show that we are the stewards and we are very not only capable of managing it, but we are the premier managers. So reorganization. We're going to go through what I call a century organization. The last time the Department of Interior was really reorganized was about 100 years ago today when our parks became a part of it. So. This is why. Last year in our parks alone, we had 330 million people go through the doors of the parks. If you're around Yosemite, Yellowstone, Glacier, 
sequoias, uh, some of our parks are at capacity. Uh, there's no doubt. And I'm very sensitive to the experience of a park. Uh, when you go to Yosemite, you shouldn't experience the I-5 traffic. So how do we do it? Well, it's time to look at the public lands around the park and make sure things like wildlife corridors, trail systems, sewer systems, watersheds, coordinate and work together. And you look at how we're presently organized as we have the Park Service reporting to their region, you have the Forest Service reporting to their region, the Fish and Wildlife reporting to their region, the Army Corps of Engineers reporting to their region. Everyone reports to these different regions and none of them line up. Not geographically, not in numbers, not any, uh, some of them are by who knows uh, how, how they're organized. So what we're looking at is this is we're going to reorganize by ecosystems. So right now we have a really big headquarters and really big super regions, uh, primarily in Denver and primarily in, in Washington, D.C. But the front line uh, needs to be shored up. As a, as a military commander, you know, I, I look at the history of these cost-cutting measures. And what's occurred is we've taken the front line and we've we've taken resources out of the front line and regionalized. And so the front line itself uh, is not capable of making the decisions. And they feel like they're, mi they're micromanaged. And then the decisions they should be able to make, they're not able to make. And some of it's resources, some of it is, again, uh, they've been stripped out of, out of the scientists that are in the field. And so we have to reorganize uh, to push the resources where they should be in the front line. So we're looking at maybe a dozen or so of these ecosystems, and this is how it's going to work. Is if you're a national park, let's say Alaska. If you're Alaska and you're a national park, you're not going to see any difference other than you're going to get some more people. Um, you're still going to be a park service, you're still going to be a park, but rather than report to your own region, <coughs> you're going to report to a joint management area. Uh, we fight forest fires this way, this is how the military is set up. So within Alaska, everyone's going to report to a joint command, and so uh, the bureaus will begin to work together a little more, uh, which I think is important. And the state will have a plug-in where a coordinating body, so if you're going to look at a wildlife corridor, it's a good idea to talk to the state up front. And if you're a landowner and an alliance, do you need to shop to 15 different departments that sometimes will give you 15 different answers? And of the 15 different answers, two or three might be in conflict with each other. So we should, as a government, be able to reduce the conflict and work together and coordinate uh, so we do look at watersheds more, more critically. We should look at wildlife corridors. And as you know, wildlife doesn't just stay on public property. Uh, wildlife transits to multiple types of property, and we've got to be sensitive 100 years from now as we get more and more pressure, and the pressure changes. A hundred years, recreation is becoming more centric in a lot of areas. And the other advantage is this, is if you live in Seattle, Portland, and Eugene, you know, maybe all the way down to San Francisco, your view on life's a little different than it is in Montana and Utah. Uh, you know what, and that's okay. Uh, and I think we have to be more collaborative as a department, um, more willing to bend a little, one size doesn't fit all, and these ecosystems can develop a little differently uh, as they should because the people who use them for the benefit and enjoyment of the people, we have to be sensitive to that. So that's where we're going as the authority of the secretary, I have the authority to do it. Now I'm going to ask the Forest Service to play. Uh, with us. I have to ask uh, NOAA, which I think should be under Department of Interior anyway. You know, you ever wonder why in a, in, a, in a river, if you have a trout and a salmon in a river, you got to report to two agencies to figure out how much water, and it just, it just doesn't make sense to me. So we're, we're, we're going to figure out a process where we can work together better. And, and lastly, this. Uh, 16% of our force is retirement age today. 
in five years, 40% of Interior is retirement age. So we don't, we're going to go through organization. We don't have to rift. We don't have to. We don't have to do much. We have a natural you know, process of attrition, but we're also built like this. Uh, I have a lot of GS 12, 13, 14 SESs, and the structure should turn like this. Because we have to look at the future and what's a career path for someone <clears throat> in interior? What should it be? Uh, we're the first organization, the first department in the history of the government that we're about to embark on a journey of being dog friendly. Uh, and very popular. But, so, you know, why did we make that decision? Other than I really like dogs, but, uh, but, but, but so do millennials. And I have to compete. I have to compete out there in a, a market to get the best people uh, possible. And some of us morale, but some of us is getting out there and being ahead of it. So I get these employees in at a GS6, and I got to offer them a career path as they get more experience and going in and out of these joint management areas gives them a look of these different agencies so we can coordinate together. But a lot of it is if you enter in at your 22 years old or so after you get out of college and have, have a good baseline education, uh, you know, what is your future, what is your expectation working in the Department of Interior? Over your course of career, you should be able to move up have more responsibility, but I should be able to articulate a career path for you. And right now, I'm having a hard time uh, uh, doing that because we really don't have career paths within in, in interior other than, you know, last for 30 years. Uh, <laughs> lasting for 30 years is really not a career, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> it's an art. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm excited about it. I'd be worried if we didn't have good people, and Interior's got a lot of really, really good people. And I'd be worried if we didn't have the greatest holdings on earth, and it turns out we have both. And so I'm excited about that. Thanks for uh, allowing me to speak, and, and I'll take questions if you got them. Yes, sir. Just uh, explain who you are and where you're from. And Chris Bunch, Six Rivers Land Conservancy in Michigan. So All right. Eight million acres of public land in Michigan. About uh, uh, four million of it is federal. Most oh, you're a Spartan or Wolverine? Wolverine, no white. Okay. All right. I, have I used to like you. Next. <laughs> I have two maize and blue in my office. Uh, so there's about four million acres of forest service land uh, in Michigan. Uh, Chris Bunch is Yeah, up front, I think the Forest Service should be within the Department of Interior. Uh, I understand why it wasn't in over the course of time. Uh, a lot of the headwind I have is really uh, uh, in the Senate and the House. It's, it's a turf war, uh, not so much with, with, with Sonny Purdue. But I think the joint model allows it to work without having them crosswalk over uh, to it. And, and I have the authority, and Sonny has authority on these joint management areas, but we have to work together uh, on it. The Forest Service, you know, in, in, out in Montana in the West, there's a lot of frustration uh, with these catastrophic fires every year. I think the numbers are around, we spent $2 billion fighting forest fires, and a lot of it is just that the amount of dead and dying timber uh, is, is a concern. And in California, I think the number is one million trees are dead and dying. Um, so you, we have to get in there and mechanically do prescribed burns, and it goes back to management. Uh, we have to actively manage our holdings, and so we show the public uh, that we're not only capable of it, we're the best. Uh, rather than you know, our, our neighbors and, and a lot of trust properties is managed much better than we, we are. So we have to reestablish the Teddy Roosevelt creed of using best science, best practices. Uh, in Forest Service, you know, when I was a congressman, I was critical uh, of the Forest Service. Uh, now I'm nice. It's <laughs> like, I, I want to work with the Forest Service. Uh, but some of the management problems with BLM 
uh, our property is not particularly well managed and everywhere either. So, but I, I want I think the best thing we can do is work together on these regions and understanding further out east is there's less BLM uh, and these joint management areas are going to reflect the flavor of the ecosystems. In some cases they're offshore, a little more Bessie and Boehm will have a bigger play. Uh, Montana, uh, Bessie and Boehm, uh, offshore, probably not. So, but that's how we're going to uh, approach it. We've got to work together. Yes, sir? Um, Colin Novick, Massachusetts. Um, I appreciate your efforts to collaborate, particularly with local communities. We all represent locally preserved land by local folk, so we understand that relationship between the community and the land. Um, one thing I would ask is, uh, in terms of trust in working with folks, if you get a chance to look back at Executive Order 13754 with the North Bering Strait, that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, on the trust, and this and it goes back to, to trying to diffuse the anger out there. It bothers me that, that people view Smokey Bear with a flak jacket. It bothers me that when you see a BLM truck, that you should be thinking land management. And if you see a BLM truck you know, with the lights on, you know, what you should be thinking is that, my God, there's probably a kid lost. And they're gonna, they're gonna stop me to see if I've seen a kid. They'd rather than getting a ticket on County Road. And our face of law enforcement, we need to work with local sheriffs more because they're elected officials, the local sheriffs kind of know the counties. Uh, none of our holdings are not in a county. And so, you know, work with the county, work with the community. Uh, but we want to be the yep people. We want to be the happy department, the collaborative department. Uh, when our people are, are embedded in the community and they're the volunteer football coaches and softball coaches, that's a good thing. So we need to do a much better job of integrating and incorporating into, into local communities. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, Secretary Jerry Edelman from Chicago, uh, Open Lands, or Regional Land Conservation Group. But I was involved in the establishment of the first National Heritage Area, the Yainam Canal National Heritage Corridor. There are now 49 around the country. And in your spirit of partnership and collaboration, and leveraging resources, you know, the modest investment that the federal government makes in these heritage areas is multiplied numerous times and brings together diverse partners, addresses areas that are not often owned by the federal government, sometimes there are holdings within it, but to your point of corridors and access and so forth. Unfortunately, the proposed budget of the president has zeroed out funding, which is so modest in the first place. I'm just wondering if you're familiar with the heritage area movement. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, you know, up front, when I'm behind $12.5 billion in infrastructure, you know, why am I giving grants outside of us? I need to give ourselves grants. And the other thing is our revenues. Is, uh, and you saw the President's budget versus uh, what Congress, and it's round one of a, of, of a process as, as we go through. Uh, but we have to shore up our revenue. It's not that we're in a, we're in a money-making business. We're not. We, we're the stewards of a public land. So we're not a business. But there are you know, one of the things on on revenue is one of my first acts as a secretary. They signed a secretarial order reviewing every rent, every royalty across the board, because who's a stakeholder? We are. We all have a say what goes on our public land, and if you're going to operate on our public land by drilling or extraction or whatever, including wind and everything, then the public should get value uh, out of it because you're on public land. It should be transparent uh, and it should be trust but verified. So a lot of our issues in the budget, and I understand it, you know, it, if you have money in the, in the kitty, boy, it's a lot easier to fund things. Uh, but my priority is infrastructure first. Uh, well, restoring trust, infrastructure. Uh, because, and I'll give you an example. If you have time, to go to Arlington. The, we own the, the building, Lee's house up on top of the hill. You want to look at our infrastructure? Look at that building. It is a national disgrace. The shutters are falling off. It's tipped. The interior is out of standards. This is hollow ground. I can't think of very many places that mean more 
to our country's battles uh, than Arlington. And yet, it's a national disgrace. Should never have happened. It didn't happen overnight. This is years of neglect. And if Arlington is that way, you know, you look at our parks as you go through. I just want, when a, when a person goes through our parks, this is my demand. I demand that our people are in the right uniform, that the bathrooms are clean, and the experience is a five-star experience. I want to make sure that our property is is clean, the trail systems work, uh, and our legacy of what we deliver as a department should be in perpetuity. But you're right, we have other holdings and other influence outside. And this is where our National Park Foundation has been very, very good with heritage uh, and, and looking at things that are in our nation that we need to protect uh, in perpetuity. So I, I agree with you, we're going to focus on revenue so I can do exactly what we have been doing. Yes? We have to keep it to one more question. So. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, we got this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a good one. Um, Yael Gerard, the East Bay Foundation, Coastal Alabama. Um, I wanted to speak to the career track um, comments that you made. So I actually served as a seasonal ranger at Carlsbad Caverns National Park um, and also worked at the uh, Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge as an AmeriCorps. And um, I think that AmeriCorps and SCA programs throughout the park system um, and the, in all the interior lands are really, really important. That's a great way for people, young people, to get involved, get that conservation yep, mindset. I agree. And, and it's just so important there. Um, and then I believe when I was a ranger, one of the things that I just wanted to see so much more of was that continued education, ability to for the rangers to just grow and increase their knowledge and just become better stewards, become better interpreters, and um, I wanted to know if there was, you know, as you're talking about moving this career path forward, looking at some, some of that sort of thing. We are, and it's not that the military is a great model and everything, uh, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> but what they do do well is career progression and training along the way. Uh, <coughs> and we think the joint management models will allow as you go start in a, in a park, for, per se, being a being a volunteer, GS4. And you're, then you're next in GS4. <laughs> well, we, we even go GS6 now. Uh, but then your next next tour maybe is one of these joint management areas, so you understand a little little more broader about how the how the different bureaus work. Understanding the classes of property are different, so we're not saying melting you know wilderness into the park with BLM, but there are there's goodness in traditional service lines. There's goodness in having a, a spree of corps and being a wildlife, uh, fish and wildlife you know, person and maintain that uniform, maintain that tradition. But learning to work together and then you, then you go back to a park uh, and there's going to be a little education block uh, in there where you can go to school and there's incentives to it. But eventually when you, the career path to a superintendent is just not doing the clock. Uh, you have to also go through and make some checks along the way. And so when you're a superintendent, uh, you're fully capable of being a steward and working together with different types of people around your borders. I mean, Sequoia is an example. Three different forests, uh, three different management schemes just around Sequoia. Uh, and Sequoia, I think, quite frankly, is one of our best managed parks. Uh, I was there recently, and I was uh, pleasantly surprised. The bathrooms were super clean, <laughs> and it just wasn't me. People, you know, are, are not used to, I guess, my leadership style because I go right to the bathrooms. <laughs> I talk to rangers. Uh, I'm pretty hands-on about uh, seeing what's going on uh, in there. But Sequoia, for those in, in, in that part, you should be proud of Sequoia. They they do a magnificent job. So, anyway, thank you uh, for what you do. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this. You know, be an optimist. You know, uh, be a leader. They're, they're the political here in this city, one is if you think that this is normal, uh, you really need to look at life a little differently. <laughs> no, nothing in Washington is normal, but the polarity of our politics, uh, you know, I think most of us need to be just red, white, and blue. Um, public lands is not a political issue. 
uh, it, it should be viewed, in my judgment, as an American issue. So if we work together and be red, white, and blue and be a leader, then other people will look at that and go, you know what, uh, maybe it's worth uh, uh, being American first, just like Teddy said. So thanks. <laughs> this is yours, right?